This video is sponsored by Brilliant. More about them later. I love my electric bike. I love it so much, I wish sometimes I could just cycle forever. So, I bought a solar panel, attached it to the back of my bike, and in this video, I'm gonna see how far I can cycle without running out of charge. How hard can it be? I'm unable to charge my bike while I'm cycling, so here's how this is gonna work. I'm going to start with a fully charged battery in the bike, and I bought a second battery, which is going to start empty and will be attached to the solar panel. When the first battery runs out of charge, I replace it with the second one, we find out how much charge I managed to get, and then we repeat the process until both batteries are completely out of charge. Ah, look at me. Young, dumb, full of hope about this experiment. Because yes, in this video, I'm performing an experiment. And my hypothesis is that by charging my electric bike as I cycle, I can make a 200 kilometer journey, turning a short distance mode of transport into a long distance mode of transport. This video is about that experiment and why it went wrong. I'm setting out east from the centre of my hometown of Bath and aiming for London. I'm leaving at eight, 53 a.m. So if I get to London, if I make it that far, I should be arriving at 7 p.m. First of all, though, I've got to get out of Bath. This is the bit I'm most worried about. <laughs> Leaving at nine on the dot. Here we go. And now I'm on the cycle track by the canal for the next 100 miles. I'm going to be cycling largely along the Kennet and Avon canal path, which I use every week to cycle to my mum's. I wasn't keen on cycling on main roads because of the trailer and the small chance something could fall out of it and damage a vehicle. It could be dangerous. So the canal path. It runs from Bath to Reading, and then, as with most things, once you reach Reading, things go downhill. I'll be finishing the route on some main roads aiming for the centre of London and specifically Big Ben. I should probably mention, I'm filming this on one of the sunniest, obviously, but also hottest days of the year, so I'm kind of wishing for shade, but at the same time shade is the last thing I need today. Now the total planned route today is about 200 kilometers, and uh, according to my watch, I've gone, oh, three. <laughs> I thought it was more than that. One of the reasons I'm wearing these sunglasses is to keep the sun out of my house. The main reason is because I'm in a mortal struggle with pollen at this time of year. My eyes are streaming. Unless I'm mistaken, I believe I've just crossed the Dundas Aqueduct. Just the first time mark on the route. However, I think I may have just taken a moment. Yeah, I want to be on that side of the river. Okay. I'm walking my bike because I was politely asked to buy a sign. That's what you need, you need a panel on it. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know how well it works yet. <laughs> <laughs> Great pub here called the Cross Guns, do excellent cheese and chips. Yeah, exactly. oh. a mountain bike trail here. First milestone reached, this is Bradford on Avon. This is also the first lock of the trip. If you don't know what a lock is, uh, I'll explain it in a little bit because we're, we're going to see more of these. It's been just over an hour. We ticked over the hour mark, so I'm just going to stop briefly, take on some water, maybe have a snack. Uh, we've gone 16 kilometers, 60% charge left. We'll definitely make 30, maybe 35 kilometers before we need to change over. Solid. A problem I wasn't expecting, <laughs> my panel's getting dusty. I'm going to have to clean it off. This is like the Mars Rovers. I don't, is, is this going to be what finishes me off? <laughs> Dust. When writing up an experiment or scientific study, you break it up into sections. First of all, an introduction in which you introduce your hypothesis that you've already heard, background information, including assumptions that you make in your study, methodology, results, and discussion. So what were the assumptions that went into my hypothesis? Because depending on who you are watching this, you may be thinking, yeah, this is definitely going to work. Or what are you doing? This is definitely not going to work. Let's consider the energy going into the bike and the energy leaving the bike. My bike's motor has a power output of 400 watts. So in order to truly go forever, I would need a solar panel with 400 watts of capacity. But I don't have that. I have 100 watts. However, you can dial in how much support the electric bike gives you at any time. And on the cycle, I was using no more than 50% power. So I wasn't using 400 watts, I was using 200 watts. And further, my kind of electric bike only engages its motor when I'm pedaling and going less than 25 kilometers per hour. In my everyday usage, I estimate that I go over that threshold 
about 50% of the time. So in a given hour, say, I draw 200 watts half the time, so 100 watts on average. This is looking a bit better, but the panel is only going to generate 100 watts of power in direct sunlight when it's facing the sun. And that's not always going to be the case. I need to multiply the 100 watts going into my system by some number between 0 and 1 to represent how frequently I'm facing in the wrong direction. I estimated that this would be 50% of the time. And so, on average, I would be generating 50 watts. Now this may look like I'm setting myself up for failure, but firstly, this 50% and this 50% are just estimates. They could be wrong. Secondly, if it looks like I'm drawing too much charge too quickly, then I can just reduce the amount of support that the bike is giving me. And thirdly, I don't need to finish with a full battery. If I expend a battery and plug in a new one and find that I've only charged it to 60%, say, yeah, eventually I'm going to run out of charge, but it still might be enough to get me to London. And especially when you consider the fact that I'm going to have to take breaks and I'm going to have to eat lunch, there will be times when I won't be cycling and I'll just be able to charge for free. The numbers are borderline, but I thought there was a chance it could work. There were, however, a few things I didn't expect. So I did a bit of a stop check after my refuel stop and uh, it's not looking great. I was storing a few things in the trailer and yeah, they're all gone. Like, the, the route here is so much bumpier than I would have expected. And not only are a couple of tools gone, so too is the shock absorption I put in. At this point, I'm concerned for the structural integrity of this whole setup, let alone the charge. I may need to adjust the route at this rate because I don't know how much long, longer the bike can take this. The path here is so narrow. I'm not feeling too confident about this. All right, nothing to do but try. I should mention, by the way, that I've been using this bike for over two years now, and I love it. Pretty much any journey up to 10 or 15 kilometers in the local area, I'll use the bike for. It's definitely made me fitter and more active. And to be honest, I've not had any problems with it at all. I'd still highly recommend getting an electric bike, especially if you live in a hilly city like Bath. One hour, 40 minutes in, and we've gone just shy of 23 kilometers. So we're over 10% of the way. Hey. It's been challenging, this terrain, like in a way that if I didn't have the trailer would be fine, but lots of little annoying things, like it keeps triggering the parking brake because the, the path's so narrow and the vegetation keeps clipping it. This is tough, <laughs> tougher than I was imagining. Okay, we are 30 kilometers in, two and a bit hours. I'm limited by the terrain. I'm hoping that, I, <sighs> I don't know, man. Like, up ahead it looks like it's clearer, but I thought it was clearer back there. I wasn't planning on taking um, a rest here. I was going to take a rest when I changed over the battery, but uh, I'm still cycling. I've been going for two hours. Um, I'm going to need to take on some water and some snacks and just have a breather. So whilst I'm doing that, I may as well let the battery charge up a bit. I'm not hopeful about how much juice we've actually got, so I think it's going to need all the help it can get. So I mentioned before, if you don't know what a lock is, basically, if you're on a canal and you need to go up, then water doesn't flow uphill. You've got to trap a little bit of water in like a container and then pump water from further upstream so that that trapped bit of water raises in level. You can then open the gates at the higher end and you can carry on. Normally, these locks come in sort of ones, maybe twos, but uh, sometimes you've got to go up big hills, such as, Behind me, this is one of the landmarks on the route. This is Cairn Locks. This is one of the only significant bits of uphill on the trip. It's really the most significant bit of uphill on the trip. So I was expecting the battery to die around about now. And we are on, I don't know if you can read that, 12%. Not sure it's gonna get me up the hill, but uh, not bad going. I feel like the estimate's about right. I just now have no clue how much charge is in the second battery. Right. Let's see if 12% is enough. I've never seen this many locks in one place before, this is amazing. I think that's the end of the uphill. 
35 kilometers, nearly three hours. Oh my God, this first battery is dead. Okay, so battery is very dinked up, but partially charged, not very much from the looks of things. Okay, clock in. I put the wrong battery. <laughs> I took that. <laughs> Second battery, a little bit dinked up and dusty, uh, and I haven't tested this yet. I, I genuinely don't know how much has gone in this in the past three hours, but click. Now it's going to originally say zero. Oh, that's not good. That's really not good. I would be lying if I said I was anything other than very disappointed in that. I'm also surprised because that's a 100 watt panel. So according to the interface, it's actually only generating 20 watts, which is uh, surprising. Oh, that's a bad miss. This was the moment I realized something had gone very wrong. I was definitely using more energy than I was generating. Now, I already mentioned one potential explanation here. Dust was covering the panel as I cycled, and so I was generating less power than expected. Time for an experiment. I have to change into a lab coat because I'm doing science. What I'm doing is recording with this camera a set of observations of how much power the panels are generating in optimal conditions, facing the sun, broad sunlight, no clouds in the sky. Then I'm going to clean off the panels and we'll see how much of a difference the dust was making by taking another set of observations. As it turns out, cleaning the panels had very little effect. Before cleaning, the panels managed 48.5 watts of power output. After the cleaning, they managed 45.5 watts of power output. Uh, I can only assume that there was some cloud covering the sun that I didn't notice, or that the water droplets on the surface were somehow reducing the efficiency. But apparently, by cleaning my solar panels, I actually made them worse. However, the fact remains that despite being rated for 100 watts and generating that much before the experiment, which I don't have proof of, you'll just have to believe me, the panel was only generating less than 50 watts in ideal conditions. I don't have an explanation for this. I wonder if maybe being jostled around in the trailer over the really rough ground caused something in the panel or the battery interface to break. But whatever the cause, I was generating a lot less power than I expected. Compounding this, I was going a lot slower than expected because the cycle track was narrower and significantly rougher than I was expecting, with that being based on how nice that same cycle path was in the other direction, the direction that I cycle in every week to visit my mum. So I was traveling below the threshold of 25 kilometers per hour, not half the time, but basically all the time. And so basically all the time I was drawing power. Back to devices, I could see that things weren't working out, but I was determined to carry on going and just see how far I could get. But when life gives you lemons, uh, try to cycle to London. That's how it goes, right? Leaving devices was interesting because it showed that away from the cycle path on road, I was actually getting beyond 25 kilometers per hour and so not using the battery. The extra drag from the trailer was significant, but my assumption of using the battery about half the time on good terrain was actually about right. However, before long, second battery has just conked out in the middle of nowhere. And yet, somehow, the irony, right underneath a power transmission line. <laughs> we are just shy of four hours in, and just shy of 45 kilometers. I was not expecting the average speed to be this slow. There are several factors. It is about lunch, no, it is lunchtime. So what I'm gonna do is leave the bike charging, for the whole time I'm gonna have lunch, like half an hour or whatever. We'll see how much charge is in the second battery. We'll go from here. I, I genuinely don't know how far it is to the nearest town. My notes are on my phone. Maybe we'll be able to get to a train station to get back. Well, may maybe. So this has been charging over lunch and I've made an improvement to the energy efficiency. Click. It's gonna show 0%. 18. So definitely an improvement. Still, 18% isn't very much, so I can't imagine we're going to be going very much further. 
At this point, it was pretty clear that the experiment had a result, and I wasn't going to get to London. My hypothesis had been disproved. Disproved because of some assumptions that went into it being incorrect, and an unexpected fault developing in my equipment. However, the experiment being done or not, I was still in the middle of nowhere. I had a new objective. Make it to the next train station on the route without running out of charge. You know, if I wasn't carrying so much stuff, and it wasn't so, quite so hot, and my allergies weren't killing me, this would be rather nice. This is quite a nice experience. I didn't start my watch immediately, so I don't have an exact number on how far we've gone, but it's been about over a kilometer, maybe about a mile. I'm already down to another percent battery. I think this experiment is going to come to an end quite soon. Four percent battery. Pusey is just about in sight on my Google Maps, but just over there, actually. I can see the train line that I want to get on. I've gone down to ultra low battery, like literally the minimum that the battery can give me. It feels like like I'm dragging a sack of potatoes behind me. Like that's literally how much extra friction it feels like. 3% battery. Oh. I'm on what I guess you could describe as the final approach to the town I'm aiming for, Pusey. We're on 1%. It is mostly downhill at the moment, so I'm just coasting, but if this goes, the only hope I have is whatever I've managed to get into the battery in the past, like, I don't know, half an hour. Which won't be much, but it could make all the difference, I don't know. I've got one eye on the road and my other eye is looking at the battery gauge. It's been on 1% and blinking for a little while. I'm not pedaling, I am purely going downhill. Come on, five minutes, five minutes away, come on. One minute, come on. Okay, 1%. I made it. <laughs> oh my god, I actually made it. Oh. Look at that. 1%. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on just about to die on the lowest level of support possible. Okay, so this isn't London, but I've run out of charge. Uh, I have nothing left in the, in the main battery, and I'm pretty sure if I checked the other one I'd have like 2%. This is, I think, where the journey has to stop, and I've just got to wait for a train. It was here, as I packed everything up and got on the air-conditioned train home, I had an epiphany. Watching the countryside go by at like, 150 miles an hour. Why didn't I just do this in the first place? This is so much easier. Electric bikes are fantastic. I love them. But they're like dwarves, designed to be used over short distances. We dwarves are natural sprinters! In last month's video on decarbonizing transport, I talked about distance dependency, how each scale of travel needs to be considered separately. And the fact is, we have travel modes appropriate for long distance that are low carbon, such as trains. And much as I love my electric bike, there's simply no need to make square pegs like it fit into round holes like intercity travel. Electric bikes will be a significant decarbonizing influence on short distance travel, especially on urban freight. But asking them to do more than that is setting yourself up for failure. Could you ever make this work? Well, if you had a working, more efficient panel, then maybe? But to be completely honest, by adding the solar system and the trailer to put it in, you're adding so much extra mass and so much extra friction that the benefits of using the electric bike over, say, a road bike just aren't worth it. I'd like to do this journey again on a road bike at some point in the future. As I said in the video, I actually really enjoyed the experience. It just turns out that I basically made it as difficult for myself as possible. When you were in school, you may have found that you were taught about subjects like solar power in a way that also made it about as difficult as possible for you. Someone stood at a board and basically just telling you things and expecting you to memorize them and then regurgitate them later on an exam. Not exactly effective at getting you to understand the material and certainly not fun. 
a more effective, interactive, easy and free way to learn about solar power and hundreds of other concepts in science is this episode's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant teaches you about maths, science and computer science in a fun, interactive way. One of the thousands of lessons, with more added every month, is on solar power and how much area would be required to power the Earth's economy with solar panels. If you're a student trying to get a different perspective to that offered in a classroom, or a busy adult who would like to learn new topics in bite-sized chunks, little and often, like I do, then Brilliant can help you reach your goals and give you a different perspective on the natural world, customising your learning to fit you. Brilliant has sponsored my videos for several years now, and I think the reason we work so well together is because if you like my videos, you're gonna like Brilliant. I try to make videos that are about processes and methods, not just about facts. And where possible, I try to implement or demonstrate a concept rather than just talking about it, as I did in this video. So if you like this video, I think you should sign up to Brilliant because I think you'll like it too. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you to do so will also get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Again, that's brilliant.org slash Simon Clark, with thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and for being, well, brilliant. Thank you so much for watching the video. This has been quite a long time in production, and in case you couldn't tell, it was quite deeply uncomfortable to make, so I really hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Special thanks must go to my executive producer patrons, whose names are on the screen right now. If you would like to support my work, choose a video topic for me to cover a month and get access to exclusive behind the scenes vlogs, then please do consider signing up to my Patreon link down there in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please do pop it a like and do share it with people that you think may find this experiment interesting. Also, let me know what you thought down there in the comments. That just leaves me to say thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.